sort of existing ideas that your work and what you speak about is confronting the like unhelpful existing preconceptions about the brain human potential that your work is confronting head on so the first thing i came up against because this was around the time of the financial crisis was the lack of understanding of the brain body connection so these high performing executives were kind of acting like their body was just the vehicle that was moving their brain around from meeting to meeting and both disrespecting their for their physical health but also not understanding that what they were actually really being paid for was to use their brain and they weren't creating the best conditions for that brain to operate in um and i'm talking about really basic things like sleep and a good diet and hydration and not being sedentary managing your stress etc so you know this tiny organ if it's not in an environment that is giving it the best chance of doing its job it's not going to and a crack's going to appear somewhere um and the first time i really kind of had a big confrontation with a bank was when people were dropping dead on the trading floor of heart attacks and they asked me to work more in my capacity as a former medical doctor to help with the physical stuff and i said i can't do that if we don't address the mental and emotional piece because that's what's causing this and they just could could not get that what did you want to do with those people in a specific and practical sense what if you could have you know been in charge of preventing them from dropping dead on the trading floor mm-hmm. where would you have started the understanding that stress so everything that you're experiencing mentally and emotionally that's challenging and things like a lot of travel which is challenging for your body that that raises levels of the hormone cortisol which comes from your adrenal glands and that cortisol courses around your blood through your entire body and brain and the brain has receptors for understanding what's going on in terms of threat to your survival so in a 24 hour cycle depending on your age and your gender there's a normal range for cortisol so it can go up and down like this you know if something challenging happens we need to adapt and rise to meet that challenge but when that level is above the top range all the time these receptors in your brain basically think that there's an imminent threat to your survival so there's this whole cascade of hormones and they basically cortisol causes inflammation in the body mm-hmm. so inflammation of your vascular system inflammation around your heart and everything else gut and you know other things but particularly around that time we were seeing a lot of heart attacks caused by stress this was in the absence of high blood pressure high cholesterol smoking it was all stress i read a i read a study and i was watching a ted talk that seemed to make the case that stress was somewhat subjective i.e. it's an interpretation of of events mm-hmm. so one can be in a situation where um they feel very stressed you can put a different person in that situation and they wouldn't experience it as stress mm-hmm. also there is i think there's quite a famous ted talk that makes the case that stress only has physiological consequences in the form of disease and inflammation and the heart attacks you're describing if we believe that stress is going to have that effect on us if we believe stress is bad it's bad yeah i get that is that true um so i would define stress as when the load that you perceive on you physically mentally emotionally or spiritually is too much for you to bear so yes it is subjective um when i moved into business and leadership people would use the terms good stress and bad stress and i found that really difficult having been a psychiatrist and seeing people actually break down to think that there's any such thing as good stress but what i have you know the way that i've adapted that over the last 10 or 15 years is that there's an adaptive response which is a healthy response to a challenge and we have that for a reason we need that and that can be a good thing but that should be a spike it should go up and it should go back down again if it stays high all the time that's not good my second question now was about the contagion of stress once upon a time i googled um because i had a th- thesis i googled is stress contagious mm-hmm. and it came up and it said it was contagious or is it contagious in what circumstances do we need to be aware of that contagion and more importantly how and why is it contagious 
Okay, I will tell you the answer to that, but I'm going to ask you a question first. Have you ever walked into a room with someone and by the time you've left that meeting with them, you yes. just feel so drained? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so of you course, know, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, so you know the feeling. So I'll, t- I'll tell you how it works physiologically. Um, I'm going to start with something else to like build you up to this story. So did you know that women who live together or work closely together will synchronize their menstrual periods within two or three months. Yeah, I found this out many years ago and it has completely changed my perception on so many things, so many things, because I have to be honest, I'm, I'm a very sort of logical, I need like science and evidence. And so I always thought about, I don't know, physical, phys- physical things. Like if I can't see it, it doesn't exist. Yeah. It's kind of been my, my like framework for thinking about life. Yeah. And when I heard about that, I checked it was true, found out it was true. And it broke the frame <laughs> in which I think, because if, if there are, invis- if, if it's possible that invisible forces now between me and you mm. are interacting with our bodies, I okay, go, well, then what else is possible? Sorry. I'm already using a certain form of eye contact with you to create emotional resonance. Uh oh. What have you done to <laughs> We're me? We're going to get sidetracked. Do you want to go back to the hormone? What kind of eye contact are you, are you using with me? <laughs> Tell me. So basically. We'll go back to the hormone thing. We'll just we'll go, park yeah, that. Yeah, we'll park that. It's, it's related. Okay. Um, so when a baby is born, one of the ways that it learns what emotion the mum's experiencing, how it understands its own emotions, you know, everything that grows over childhood and teenage into you know pro-social behavior starts off mostly with eye contact with the mum so at first they can hardly see anything they can just kind of see two blobs and then they start to understand more about like micro facial expression changes and stuff but eye contact with the mum is hugely important so most people are right-handed so they'll be holding their baby in their left arm so they can still use their dominant hand to do stuff and that means that when you gaze at your baby your right eye is looking into their left eye and then that interaction that from the optic nerve is going around the brain it's impacting the um, amygdala where emotions come from and it's creating this emotional resonance loop that's part of how the mother and the baby bond so that right eye to left eye eye contact is the most bonding eye contact that you can have with someone now you could say oh but my mum was left-handed or you could be left-handed but you know, if I'm taking a chance on trying to build that bond with someone, that's the statistically most likely one to create good resonance between you. So you walked in here and you started looking in my left eye. I waited till we sat down. (laughs) (laughs) I gave you a hug. You gave me a hug, you know, so all of those little things, they start to, and you know, we've laughed about a few things before we've come on air. Those are the sorts of things that create like, um, higher levels of the bonding hormone oxytocin so Mm -hmm. you're more likely to lower your guard trust the person Mm -hmm. take a healthy risk um so yeah i mean like i said i know that stuff so i live my life like that just want to get get, make sure i've got that clearly in my mind so i could repeat that to someone else (laughs) later it's great for dating (laughs) yeah of course it is i think we might go down that, that down that path a little bit but the reason that works is because there's this association in our brains that if someone is looking into your left eye, it kind of triggers something, a bonding response that is quite innate in us. Yeah. Is basic, that the TLDR of it? Yeah. Okay. Super interesting. What else? What else? If I'm trying <laughs> to bond with someone, yeah. so everybody listening to this right now, whether they're in work, they're in sales, they, they're looking for a partner, whatever. It's a nice little trick mm. to look into someone's left eye. I'm going to only look into your left eye for the rest with of the With your right eye. How do I? I'm just looking with both. Yeah, you feel like that. But once you start doing this, I promise you, you will notice a difference. Okay. Um, What else? What are the tricks to make to encourage bonding? Encourage bonding. So physical interaction. So, um, you know, depending on the appropriateness of it, minimum handshake, maybe a hug, maybe a kiss on the cheek, you know, depending on what um, situation you're in. I do this handshake where I, we hugged, so we didn't handshake. Mm. I, many, many years ago, I read an article that, if when you ha- ho- shake someone's hand, mm. you put the other hand over the top of it, mm-hmm. it creates a sense of warmth and trust. So I've been doing that for 10 years now. I give them my left hand or my right hand and then the other hand goes over the top of it. Yeah, It's definitely extra. And you see this in a lot of um, kind of more ancient cultures that there is like more of a handshake than what we do, which seems it's just one hand and it's quite brief and stuff. So yeah, the more of that kind of physical touch mm-hmm. that you can get, the, the best. So, you know, everyone that I've met 
since I've come in this morning, I've either shaken hands with them or hugged them. And I would not not do that. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else in terms of encouraging the release of oxytocin that you're aware of? What are the behaviours that increase that bonding chemical in our brains? Um, Eye contact and touch are the main ones. Laughing together is another one. Um, And then not to do with another person, but if you take a bath rather than a shower, then you'll release more oxytocin. Massage helps. Well, you're immersed in warm water, so it feels like a hug. So you would theoretically get out of the bath and and be kinder and happier and more people would want to bond with you more. Well, you'll be more in the mode of bonding, doing that. Yeah. So interesting. What about um, vulnerability? Because I I heard shared struggle is one of the things that releases oxytocin. Yeah. So, um, yeah, going through something not necessarily traumatic, but that's highly emotional, that is very bonding as well. So we see this a lot on the reality shows where people are like, oh, we're going to be friends for life. You know, if you do something like a skydive or a bungee jump in a group, then, you know, you do feel more bonded to those people. Um, But they're not as practical as the just the little things that you can do every day. 